Hey there, in this lecture, I'll give you an introduction of what Spark is and what it's best used for. So let's get started. Apache Spark is a general purpose distributed big data processing platform. Now, I know that's a mouthful, right? So uh, to better understand how Spark works, let's go over an example. The example typically presented to explain how big data technologies work uh, is the word count problem. So I'll stick to that convention because I think it's easier to understand. Let's say that you have a file containing words uh, from an article or a book. If you needed to get the total count of occurrences of each word, what would you do? Well, for small files, this should be a trivial task, right? You just need to write a program that increments a counter for each word and store the words and their uh, frequency counts into a hash map or, or a similar data structure. Simple enough, right? But what happens when you need to do this for big data, right? Let's say you are trying to figure out the most trending words on the internet. In this case, you'll be dealing with ingesting massively large files, and you can't rely on a single application running on a single computer to tackle the data on the internet, right? The programming exercise is simple, computing the frequency of words, but doing that for big data is an entirely different story. We'll have to engage a large cluster of computers to work together because the data is just way too big for one computer to handle. If you were to architect a system like this yourself, you'd need to worry about ingesting very large files and then uh, figuring out how to distribute them evenly across the cluster so that each machine can work on its own subset of data. You'd need to create a master process to coordinate which machine is processing which part of the text and so on, and then aggregate each machine's total counts. So already this is you know, getting pretty complicated, and we haven't even discussed performance issues or how to handle the situation where a machine experiences failure, like running out of memory or disk space, or losing its network connection for whatever reason. Hopefully, you're beginning to see that things get quite complex as the data scales up, right? Even for simple problems. Well, here's the good news. Spark handles all of this complexity so that you can focus on the business problem at hand, right? And you won't have to worry about all of this overhead. Spark provides a very simple to use API to perform the common analytics. This is great for programmers as well as data analysts because using this API, you can test and write applications as if they were uh, to be run on, on, on a local computer, on your local machine. And once they're launched onto the network, Spark takes care of uh, performance optimizations and running that code across large clusters. All you have to simply do is monitor the big jobs uh, using a, uh, a user-friendly browser application. So this is awesome. Now, Spark wasn't the first platform to handle this problem, okay? Spark is thought of as the next generation big data platform. The original predecessor that made working with big data possible is the Hadoop framework. It is the foundation on which Spark is built upon. Prior to the release of Hadoop, there was no real reliable system to run computations on very large data sets. A relational database was okay for working with gigabytes of data, but terabytes of data were proving too much for a medium-sized SQL database. And as the amount of data was growing exponentially to petabytes and petabytes, there was a serious need for a system to process massively large data sets and compute aggregations and analytics to get high-level insight from big data. So a little over 10 years ago, Hadoop came to the rescue. It facilitated using a network of many computers to reliably run computations in parallel, okay? So for the first time in history, Hadoop really did make big data analytics possible for the masses. It was truly a revolutionary product and is still widely used today. As a matter of fact, it's actually recommended that you use Spark with the Hadoop distributed file system. So they really go hand in hand. You can certainly use Spark without Hadoop. As a matter of fact, most of this course, we're gonna be coding in our local environment, so that's absolutely fine. But in production or in real systems, you need a distributed file system and Hadoop provides a wonderful distributed file system. But even if you don't wanna use that in production, you have other options such as uh, Amazon S3 or other distributed uh, you know, cloud storages. Now, don't worry, you don't need to know Hadoop for this course, but we will be touching upon it later, and at that time, I'll explain to you the details that you may need to know. Apache Spark is the next generation of big data analytics, and I'm calling it next generation because 
First of all, it's much easier to write distributed applications using the Spark API because the syntax is very easy to read and understand. Secondly, it's much faster. Spark, in many cases, has been found to be 100 times faster than Hadoop, right? That's amazing. And the main reason behind this speed improvement is that Spark's unique design allows for keeping large amounts of data in memory, whereas Hadoop saves the intermediate uh, steps of data processing on the disk. And as you're probably already aware, reading and writing to disk is very expensive. So this is a big win for Spark. Now, this doesn't mean that Spark doesn't read and write to disk. It absolutely does, but it does that a lot less than Hadoop. And that is why it's much faster. Another huge win for Spark is its user-friendly API. Like, take a look at this comparison. Both programs are doing the same thing, but Hadoop's API, this is actually more specifically the MapReduce API, but not important to go over that right now. The Hadoop's API, as you can see, is far more rigid and difficult to code than the Spark API. Now the code that you see for Spark is still an older way of handling things in Spark, okay? The new and improved API is even simpler. It looks like this. This is the new dataset API provided in Spark version 1.6. As you can see, this is much simpler to code. Anyone that has some database experience can tell that this last line here is doing a group by on the value column and we're doing a count, okay? So very easy to do aggregates here. And the cool thing is you don't even have to worry about query optimization. As far as you're concerned, you're coding this on your local desktop, okay? You're using the dataset API to write the program. Once you give this program to Spark, you don't have to think about a huge multi-node cluster. You're just coding on your local desktop. You give this to Spark and Spark will figure out how best to run your code on a massive cluster. This is awesome. It's very simple and it's very powerful. The dataset API is at a high level, so you can focus on solving your business problems rather than worrying about what is going to happen in your cluster. Now, if you want to code at a lower level, you can certainly do that. The API does provide access to the RDD objects that uh, th those, we'll get into those later, but basically those are containers that manage distributed data. And you can get to that at a granular level and skip the query optimizer and take control of your own execution. You can certainly do that. And I'll show you later in the course how you can access those RDD objects directly if you need to, and how you can convert uh, back and forth from higher level data containers like the data frame and data set down to the RDDs. Now, I know you're probably anxious to set up your development environment and start coding Spark applications. But before we get to the code, I want to talk about some high level components that make up Spark at an architectural level. So we're going to cover that in the next lecture. So stay tuned. I'll see you soon.